What is up guys? This series is all about the Kalman filter. But this is not a boring series where you just have definitions of the Kalman filter and that's all there is. We actually start with an intuitive understanding of the Kalman filter. We give examples, we develop this intuitive understanding and after that we go into the mathematical part of things. Once that is done, of course, any engineering idea is not complete without implementation. So what we want to do is we also want to introduce the code for Kalman filter from scratch in Python. So again, in this video, we develop an intuitive understanding of the Kalman filter. In the next video, we'll talk about something called the alpha beta filter, which forms the basis of what a Kalman filter is. After that, we will formally introduce the Kalman filter with equations. Once that is done, we will go into the coding side of things. So we will implement a Kalman filter from scratch using a 1D example. Once that is done, we will move to a 2D example. And after that, we will of course keep developing this series with more and more understanding of different kinds of Kalman filters. So let's begin. To do that, let's actually start with two simple problem statements instead of just throwing jargons at you when it comes to a Kalman filter. Let's say there is a museum and the museum decided to use a robot to patrol the area during the night. So what is the robot supposed to do? The robot is actually supposed to know where it is in the museum map or the floor plan and constantly move from one point to the other based on whatever trajectory or path it is actually given. In addition, it is also supposed to look at its surrounding, find obstacles and move according to the obstacle. So find its way around obstacle. So again, the robot is supposed to understand where it is in the map. Second, the robot is supposed to navigate according to a set path. Let's talk about the first part only. Let's assume that the second part, which is path planning and the third part, obstacle avoidance is done. We have a solution for that. The first part is robot localization, right? That is how the robot would know where it is at any point in time. How do we do that? A simple solution to that would be just using odometry, right? You would have odometry using wheel encoders on the robot and we will start at a set point, let's say 0, 0, 0 in the map. So the robot would know that, hey, at time t equals to 0, I was at 0, 0, 0. We are moving in a 2D plane, of course, so the third zero doesn't matter. As the robot moves, the odometry value will tell us how the robot is moving and where it is at any point in time, right? Well, things are not so simple because odometry values will have noise. Like any sensor in the real world, you will have noise in your measurements. If you did not have any noise, you'd be able to precisely have measurements of the real world, whether it be robot location or any other problem statement. So because no sensor is perfect, you will have noise and because of that you will also have drift over time in your localization values. So you will not have good estimate of where the robot is at any point in time, right? And that was our problem statement. What do we do about it? Before we jump to a solution for this, let's also look at another example in the domain of computer vision. Let's say you have a video stream of football match and you are supposed to track a football. In this case, let's also assume that you have a detector that detects the football in each frame. So as you move from frame T to T plus 1 to T plus 2, your detector will work on each frame to understand where the football is. But well, in a real world scenario, you would have occlusion. Maybe the detector is noisy because your detector is not perfect, right? You'd also have issues like motion blur, which would reduce the accuracy of your detector. What do we do? Because in this case also, your detector is not able to precisely estimate the position or the location of the ball when you're moving from one frame to the other. Now let's make the problem statement even harder. Suppose you have two footballs in the frame and you want to track the both of them. How do you do that? Well, you can use a detector on each frame and you will get, let's say for frame T, two balls. And for frame T plus one, the detector will work again. If you have motion blur, if your detector is not perfect, which is usually the case, or if you have occlusion, you might not be able to track both the footballs always, right? Maybe you'll be able to find the football in some frames, but not in all of them. Now the problem here is, let's say two footballs are being tracked and everything is fine and at some point one detector is not able to find the location of one of the footballs because it is occluded. After a couple of frames, let's imagine that in the real world the positions of these balls are interchanged. If you don't have enough detections for let's say one of the footballs for let's say 20 frames, the detector will just give out frames but we won't really know how the ball moved and maybe we would confuse ball one for ball two. So how do we even track these balls and estimate the position of the ball even if you don't have a detection in the frame because your detector is not perfect? 
Well, these are two slightly generic problem statements where a Kalman filter comes into the picture. Generally speaking, in both these problem statements, you want to estimate a state. In the first example, your state was the location of the robot. And in the second example, the state was the location of your football. Now enters the Kalman filter. The Kalman filter is a tool that helps you estimate a state even when the measurement values are unpredictable, noisy, sometimes absent and uncertain in general. It does so by using a mathematical model to predict the value of the state at time t based on the value of the state at time t minus 1 or the estimate of the state at time t minus 1 and a mathematical model. And this mathematical model will establish a relationship between the value of the state at time t minus 1 and the value of the state at time t. Now this is the first step of the Kalman filter. In the second step, it compares the prediction you just did based on the mathematical model and the measurement value you get for time t. So at time t minus 1, it will have its own estimate of what the state is. And at time t, what it does is 1 using a mathematical model inside it, it will say that or it will predict the value of this state. Once that is done, it gets the measurement from your sensor, which of course is noisy, but it still has a lot of information inside it and compare it with the predicted value from step one. After this, it actually makes an estimate based on its own mathematical model from step one and the measurement value from the sensor. This is called the estimate for time t and that is your new estimate of your state. Making this slightly more formal, you have two steps. One is called state prediction. The second one is called state update. In state prediction, based on the estimate value from time t minus 1 and an internal mathematical model, Kalman filter predicts what the value of the state should be at time t. Step two is called state update. In state update, it compares the value it got from your state predict step which will be your prediction at time t with the measurement value it got from the sensor. So it combines these and after your state update step, you have an estimate of your state value. Why do we need two steps in a Kalman filter? We could just use our sensor or just the mathematical model, right? Well, this is the problem with using only one of them. If you only use your first step, which is your state predict step, you are actually using an ideal mathematical equation. For instance, let's say you are estimating the position of a car, which is just moving in a straight line. This is a very simple example, but hear me out. In this case, you can simply use your laws of motion in physics to understand where the car is moving given a specific velocity and specific acceleration, right? Well, the problem is this is a good mathematical model in an ideal world. In the real world, let's say the car is moving, you will also have something like slippage, right? So your car will actually not follow these uh, mathematical models in an ideal manner. And that over time will lead to wrong values if you just use your mathematical model or your state predict equation. So that's why you can't just use your state predict step. Now, what about state updates? step. Can't you just use your sensor measurement values to understand what the value of the state is and not care about your mathematical model or your state predict step? Well, the problem is in a real world, all sensors are noisy. You do not have a perfect sensor. And that is why if you just use your uh, sensor values, you would just have a lot of noise. And from time t to t plus one, you would just move from one noisy value to the other. And that just makes no sense, right? So that's why you need to combine the information you already have about how a state should evolve using your state predict step and the actual sensor measurement values. One of the cornerstones of the Kalman filter is that you combine information where no information is useless. Any data point gives you some information about what the state should be. In isolation, both these uh, different steps or both these different sources of information, one is your uh, state model and the second one is your uh, measurement value have significant errors or noise. But when you combine them, you are actually extracting useful information based on whatever individual information you have. So that's why a Kalman filter needs both the state predict step and state update step. Only one of them means you're not using a Kalman filter. Now let's make this intuition more concrete by revisiting the two examples we had in the beginning of this video. The first one was about the robot in a museum, right? The problem statement required us to have a good robot localization value. So the state we wanted to estimate was robot position. Now, in this case, what we can do is we have odometry values and that is your sensor. If you use a Kalman filter in the first step, which is state predict, we can have a laws of motion based uh, state model. So we can, let's say, assume a constant velocity model. And we would say that if at time t, the robot was at this position and you have a constant velocity, then at time t plus one, the robot should be here in the 2D space. Well, this is your state predict step. 
And in the state update step, you have your odometry values. So the state update step will improve the value of your state prediction. Now bear in mind that I just said we are using a constant velocity model in our state predict step. So in your constant velocity model, you can use your laws of motion, no acceleration. So using your laws of motion, you can get the value of your state, which is the robot position at time t based on wherever it was at time t minus one and the velocity. But you might have this question that velocity is not constant in the real world. You would want to accelerate, right? And additionally, the world is not ideal. So you would, of course, want to have a scenario where the velocity could change. Well, while I said the velocity is constant because we're using a constant velocity model, that assumption only holds true when we are actually using our state predict step to go from time t minus one to t. Only in that interval, your velocity is constant. Let's say your velocity was not constant, your measurement step, so your state update step will also fix this. Your state update step will change the value of your velocity. Even if you started with a constant velocity of let's say one meter per second, when you do your state update, because of the measurement values, uh, deviating from this idea of uh, one meter per second or five meter per second fixed velocity, you will change this velocity. So this velocity also becomes a part of your state. And in the next iteration, you will have a different value of the velocity, even though initially you assume that your velocity was one meter per second, let's say. Now, if this is not super clear, don't worry about it just yet, because in the next video, we will do a numerical example with something like this, where you will understand why I started with the assumption of, let's say, constant velocity and why the velocity will still change in your numerical example. Now, looking at the second example around computer vision, it is again the same. You would use an internal model for your state uh, predict and state update will use your measurement values to correct your uh, prediction and you will get your final estimate. That is all there is for these two examples and that's how a Kalman filter works. Also, please note that to improve your state estimate, you can of course use mold sensors and do sensor fusion, but that is not the essence of this video and sensor fusion is something which is of course done. You would use multiple sensors, but a Kalman filter is still used so that you can estimate the value of your state in a better way because you would combine the value of the sensors and your inherent understanding of how the state should evolve. So as a summary, Kalman filter works in two steps. One is state predict. The second one is state update. State predict uses a mathematical model to understand how the state evolves with time. And the state update step improves the prediction value we get from state predict using the sensor measurement values. And both of them together are quite powerful. In fact, it is so powerful that it was used in the Apollo mission to land on the moon. That is a great testimony to the Kalman filter, right? It is an incredible tool and it is used all over in robotics. If you want to even further increase your intuitive understanding of the Kalman filter, think of it like playing a catch game with your friend. Your friend is throwing a ball at you. When he or she is just starting, you would have an idea. You would already have an estimate of where the ball should go. It would be rough, right? But you would actually think about where the ball will go. When the ball is thrown, you actually update this idea or this estimate based on what you're actually seeing. So naively speaking, it's like a Kalman filter working, right? Because at every time instance t, you think about where the ball should land and where you should be to catch the ball. And as and when the ball moves, you update it. So let's say the ball was moving straight towards you and you would think that the ball would come directly at you. So you just stand there. But at some point, the ball curves a little. So you would update your estimate in your head based on what you see, which is the measurement value, and you would go to where you think the ball should be. So this is actually like a Kalman filter if you think about it. So this was an intuitive understanding of the Kalman filter. Now, in the next video, we will start with something called an alpha beta filter and have a numerical example. It will clear up so many concepts we have discussed in this video and you will understand these ideas more concretely. So I will see you in the next video. Hope you like this video. I'd love to know what you think. Bye-bye.